for the Los Angeles for the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services and Associate Chief Medical Director of Neurological Services and Chief of Neurology at LA County and University of Southern California Medical Center. Dr. Tofigi's research has focused on healthcare delivery redesign to improve access to care, quality of care, and patient outcomes in safety net settings to reduce inequalities. She has collaborated closely with UCLA researchers developing and testing novel models of healthcare delivery in the Department of Health um, Safety Net System. She's published extensively on sex, race, ethnic, and social economic disparities in stroke and has tested interventions designed to address disparities in post-stroke care. She received the Robert G. Seeker New Investigator in Stroke Award from the American Heart Association and the Michael S. Pesson Stroke Leadership Prize from the American Academy of Neurology. She served as chair of the American Stroke Association Quality and Outcomes Committee and served on numerous writing groups for American Heart Association scientific statements and guidelines, including chair of the post-stroke depression scientific statement. And she's the vice chair of the secondary stroke prevention guidelines, which she will be presenting today. It's my pleasure to turn over the presentation to Dr. Tufigi. Thank you so much for that kind of uh, introduction, Deb. And it's really my pleasure to be here discussing the secondary stroke prevention guidelines today. These guidelines are an update to the 2014 guidelines for the secondary uh, for secondary stroke prevention. Um, I just want to acknowledge our amazing writing group. I served as the vice chair. Don Kleindorfer was the chair of the guideline committee, and we had a terrific um, work group uh, working on these guidelines for the past two years. I have no disclosures. So there's three learning objectives for today. The first is to compare and contrast the changes that were made to the new guidelines with respect to format and um, sections. The second is to explain rationale for spe specific strategies for secondary stroke prevention. And the third is to be able to describe the top, top 10 most important takeaway points from the guidelines. So just to give you a little bit of background, in 2017, the American Heart Association changed the way they were doing guidelines. In the past, the guidelines had been very wordy, had been really like extensive systematic reviews of the literature and were hard to read. So in 2017, they made changes to make the text much shorter and to have modular, modular chunks um, for each topic. And in each chunk, you have a table of recommendations, a brief synopsis of the recommendations. And for each recommendation, there's specific text supporting that recommendation. We try to incorporate flow diagrams and algorithms whenever possible. And uh, the references are hyperlinked. And you can refer to the data su supplement, which is a separate document that has all the evidence tables if you want to get uh, more information about where the recommendations came from. I also want to tell you a little bit about the scope of this guideline. This guideline pertains specifically to secondary prevention of ischemic stroke. So individuals who've had an ischemic stroke or TIA, what do you do to prevent a, a recurrent stroke? Um, we did cover some things in the acute care setting only if it was per pertinent to secondary stroke prevention. And we did not include topics that are covered in other guidelines, such as acute management, intracerebral hemorrhage, primary prevention, and a few special considerations, such as special considerations in women, which was a scientific statement that we uh, released, as well as the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis recommendations. Compared to 2014, there were a few changes in um, the way it was organized. We added a new section on diagnostic evaluation as it pertains to secondary stroke prevention. Then we had a category, uh, a section on vascular risk factor management. And the third category was on management by etiology. And by etiology, we went, we went with the TOAST classification that includes large vessel atheros, small vessel disease, cardioembolism, other and a new section on embolic stroke of undetermined source. And finally, we had a section on systems of care for secondary stroke prevention. 
Each section has knowledge gaps and future research uh, segments um, with recommendations on additional areas for research. I want to talk briefly about how the um, the guide the, the the strength of recommendation as well as the quality of evidence. So for every recommendation, you'll see a class which is um, one two a two b three benefit uh, no benefit and three harm. So if um, if a treatment strategy causes much more benefit than risk, that would be a class one strong recommendation. Class 2A is if the benefit is still greater than the risk. And class 2B is if the benefit is greater than or equal to risk. Now there's two class three recommendations. One is no benefit. That's if the benefit equals the risk. And then there's a class three harm where the risk is greater than the benefit. Now the strength of the recommendation has nothing to do with the quality of the data. The quality of the data are, um, covered under the level of evidence. So level A is when there's one or more high quality randomized control trials uh, or meta-analyses of high quality randomized control trials. Level two, uh, sorry, level B, R is moderate evidence from one or more randomized trials or meta-analyses of moderate quality randomized trials. B, N, R is moderate quality evidence from well-executed non-randomized studies. CLD is limited data, so there may be randomized or non-randomized observational or registries that have limitations in design. And level CEO is expert opinion. So here, you're not, we're not basing it on randomized trials or even non-randomized trials. These are just clinical experience of experts. So I'm going to talk about the first section, which is the diagnostic evaluation, which was a new section for these guidelines. So I mentioned before that we divided um, the management according to stroke subtypes. So in order to figure out what the stroke subtype is, you need a diagnostic evaluation. And to just ground you in just the, um, the nomenclature here, as you know, um, about 85 to 88% of strokes are ischemic strokes. And amongst ischemic strokes, about one quarter are lacunar and the rest are non-lacunar. And amongst non-lacunar strokes, they can be divided into cardioembolism, cryptogenic, large artery atherosclerosis, and other. Now, within cryptogenic strokes, there's two types. There's embolic stroke of undetermined source or ESIS and non-ESIS. So when you think about ESIS, think about a stroke that is cryptogenic that looks embolic in origin. And when I say embolic in origin, I'm talking about it might be um, bilateral or in anterior and posterior circulations and often cortical strokes. Throughout the guidelines, um, we assume that clinicians will be doing shared decision-making with their patients, describing the risks, benefits, and options to patients and developing a plan that take into account patients' wishes. And the second thing that I want to point out is um, it's so important to assess adherence at every visit and not to assume that a recurrent stroke is due to a failure of a medication, but to check whether or not the patient is taking the medication. Um, I feel that often that is forgotten when people are talking about this antiplatelet versus that antiplatelet. Um, a key thing is are patients taking the me their medications? And if not, what can we do to help them to, to be able to take their medications? So for the diagnostic evaluation section, we have um, an algorithm. And I'm just gonna, rather than walk you through the entire algorithm, I'm just gonna tell you a few key basic points. So we have class one recommendations for, get, for diagnostic imaging of the brain parenchyma parenchyma to diagnose a stroke. So either a CT or MRI is class one. If um, there's no stroke seen on the initial CT or MRI, it's reasonable to do a repeat imaging. The second class one um, recommendation is to do EKG and basic lab tests. And those are delineated in the guideline, but they include things such as um, electrolytes, CBC, coax, A1C, 
lipid profile. Um, then the, the other class one medication is non-invasive carotid imaging with CTA, MRA, or ultrasound. And um, class 2A recommendations for intracranial imaging of the vasculature as well as extracranial vertebral basilar system. There's a class 2B recommendation for echocardiography to look for cardioembolic sources. And with all of those, those studies, if a cause is not identified, um, then there's a class one recommendation for prolonged rhythm monitoring to, um, uh, to detect uh, atrial fibrillation. And class two recommendations for other studies, such as screening for a PFO, testing for genetic stroke syndromes, vasculitis, and other causes of stroke. All of these depend on the clinical picture, of course, and um, we uh, do not recommend sending all these studies without um, a clinical reason. So the next section is on vascular risk factor management. I'm going to start with antithrombotic medications. This is really one of the big pillars of secondary stroke prevention. It is such an important and controversial topic that we actually asked for a separate systematic review, which was published by a separate group that um, there was a, basically a wall between the guideline committee and the evidence review committee who did this evidence-based review. Some of the guidelines here are based on the evidence-based review, um, but we specifically asked them about single versus stool antiplatelet therapy, and our guidelines cover a little bit more than that. So we have um, uh, the WARS trial from many years ago looked at warfarin versus aspirin and showed that aspirin is superior to warfarin for secondary stroke prevention because of the bleeding risk with warfarin. And so there's a class one at, uh, recommendation for antiplatelet therapy over anticoagulation. Additionally, multiple trials have shown that either aspirin plus extended release dipyridamol, aspirin alone, clopidogrel alone are, um, are reasonable options for secondary stroke prevention. And the trials include um, Capri that looked at aspirin plus clopidogrel, ESPS2 and Esprit that looked at extended release uh, dipyridamol plus aspirin versus aspirin, and Profess, which looked at um, Agronox versus clopidogrel. Now, um, we have a few new um, trials. So Chance and Point looked at dual antiplatelet therapy for, the sh for a short time period after a minor stroke or high-risk TIA. And uh, based on these two trials, there's a level, there's a class 1A recommendation for dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin plus clopidogrel for three weeks to 90 days, followed by single antiplatelet therapy in patients who have a high-risk TIA or a, a low, uh, a small stroke, a minor non-cardioembolic stroke. Um, additionally, there was a trial that looked at ticagrelor in patients with minor to moderate stroke and high-risk TIA. The high-risk TIA was uh, defined a little bit differently in this trial. Um, and um, this was the Thales trial. And so it's reasonable to uh, give ticagrelor plus aspirin for 30 days. However, it may increase the risk of bleeding. Therefore, it's a 2B recommendation. Um, in patients who are already taking aspirin, the effectiveness of increasing the dose or changing to another antiplatelet is not well established. There have been a couple of uh, um, post hoc analyses of SPS3 and chance. However, um, we, we need more data on this. And finally, continuous use of dual antiplatelet therapy is not indicated and can cause harm with excess risk of hemorrhage without benefit. So we don't recommend an, uh, dual antiplatelet beyond 90 days. Um, a really simple algorithm to help you remember when to use dual is high risk TIA or um, small stroke with an NIH stroke scale of less than three, reasonable to do dual antiplatelet for 90 days, after which you go with single antiplatelet. And if you're not, if you don't have a high risk TIA or a small stroke, then just go with single antiplatelet. Mm -hmm. 
So um, with regards to risk factor management, a really important component is nutrition. And um, so our nutrition uh, data is really based on primary stroke prevention uh, studies. Um, we don't have uh, data on secondary stroke prevention. But the PREDIMED uh, trial, which used a Mediterranean diet with supplementation of extra virgin olive oil or nuts versus a low-fat diet showed a reduction in stroke for those um, on the Mediterranean diet. This is primary stroke. Similarly, the Lyon diet heart trial looked at a Mediterranean diet with supplemental canola oil in patients after an MI and found a reduction in cardiovascular disease and total mortality. And um, with re regards to salt, um, again, we're looking at uh, primary uh, prevention data. A one gram reduction is associated with a 20% uh, reduction in cardiovascular events. And if you reduce it to 2.5 um, gram, sorry, if you reduce it to 1.5 grams per day, um, you reduce blood pressure by another five millimeters. And so the reason these are not class one recommendations is because they're based on um, uh, primary prevention uh, studies rather than um, secondary prevention. Now for physical activity, uh, unfortunately, there have not been that many studies looking at physical activity in, in the individuals with stroke. However, um, with um, limited data, we uh, are advising for moderate intensity activity for at least 10 minutes, four times a week, or vigorous intensity uh, activity for 20 minutes, twice a week. This is based on a post hoc analysis of the SAMPRIS trial which was a medical management versus stenting trial for intracranial athro. And they found that those who did not engage in that amount of activity had a five times higher risk of stroke MI or vascular death. Additionally, we know that um, uh, two systematic reviews of exercise classes with counseling showed um, a reduction in cardiometabolic risk factors, but not reduction in stroke. Um, and the BUST stroke trial is actually uh, an important new trial that showed that if you break up sedentary activity every 30 minutes with three minutes of light bouts of light activity, there's a, an improvement in cardiovascular health. With regards to uh, smoking and substance news, there's really nothing new here. Uh, in patients who smoke, they should be counseled to stop and um, uh, provided resources for counseling and or uh, drug therapy with nicotine replacement, bupropion or varinic clean. Um, and um, they should uh, be advised to stop. In patients with a, a history of stroke or TA, they should also be a counsel to avoid passive smoking because there is an association between environmental smoke uh, or secondary smoke and uh, stroke. With regards to alcohol, there's a J-shaped curve so that um, there is um, lower risk at about two drinks a day for men and over one drink per day at one drink per day for women. However, because it's a J-shaped curve, the risk ex increases exponentially after that amount. So if they're drinking that amount, they should be counseled to reduce or elim eliminate uh, drinking. Additionally, in individuals who um, are using stimulants or IV drug use, they should be uh, counseled to, to stop. And as you know, it's not enough to just tell someone to stop. Uh, referral to specialized services to help them with their dependency is critical. Um, with regards to hypertension management, so there are several trials which are not new um, and systematic reviews that have shown that a thiazide diuretic ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker are associated with reduced risk of recurrent stroke in individuals with stroke. However, what is new is the blood pressure goal. So meta-analysis of four randomized control trials, RESPECT, PASS-BP, SBS3, and PODCAST, showed that an intensive goal of less than 120 or less than 130, depending on which trial, 
was superior to a goal of less than 140 or less than 150. Um, therefore, we have a class one BR recommendation for a blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80. In addition, um, there's a recommendation to, to choose medication based on patients' comorbidities. And in patients who do not have a history of high blood pressure, but do have a blood pressure of over 130 over 80, we are recommending starting medications. With respect to hyperlipidemia, there are some new um, studies here. So first of all, the SPARKLE trial showed that a Torva 80 versus placebo reduces risk of recurrent stroke. However, we did not know the target LDL. So the TST study gave us that information. They found that individuals with a target LDL of less than 70 had a reduced risk of recurrent stroke compared to those with a goal of 90 to 110. And based on that, we have a new class one um, A recommendation to treat to a goal of less than 70 using azetamibe if needed, in addition to a statin. And in patients who are high risk, defined as stroke plus another major uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or stroke plus multiple high risk conditions, um, there's a recommendation to also add PSK9 therapy if a statin and azetamibe do not reduce the, the LDL to below 70. For hypertriglyceridemia, we have new recommendations as well. So the first um, is based on the REDUCE IT trial, where they randomized individuals with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, um, including a history of ischemic stroke. They had quite a few people with ischemic stroke in this trial. And they randomized them to a cosapental ethyl two grams BID plus statin versus statin alone and showed a reduction in the primary endpoint of adverse cardiovascular events. Therefore, we have a 2A recommendation, 2A because it's not in a purely stroke population, of um, adding icosapental ethyl two grams BID for individuals who have high triglycerides but less than 500. Um, additionally, we have a recommendation to um, address se severe hypertriglyceridemia because it can cause multiple adverse effects, including pancreatitis. For glucose, there's a few key points. One is that the a we recommend an A1C goal of less than 7% with those who have diabetes and uh, especially those who are less than 65. In addition, the, the treatment of diabetes should include a glucose lowering agent with proven cardiovascular benefit. The GLP-1 receptor agonists have been shown to have cardiovascular benefit and should be added in individuals with established cardiovascular disease. As, um, as with any uh, stroke, uh, there's a recommendation to include lifestyle counseling, nutritional management, diabetes self-management education, and um, support and medications. Now, with respect to the A1C level, we do not know if a lower A1C goal is um, of benefit for reducing recurrent stroke. The studies did show higher rates of hypoglycemia with um, more strict glucose con control. And then in um, individuals with prediabetes, metformin can be uh, beneficial for lowering the blood sugar and reducing the risk of diabetes. And in individuals with insulin resistance, pioglitazone can be considered. This is based on the IRIS trial, which showed a reduced risk of recurrent stroke in individuals treated with pioglitazone. Of note, you, uh, uh, patients with uh, severe congestive heart failure and uh, bladder cancer would be excluded from pioglitazone treatment. With regards to obesity, obesity and sleep apnea, we recommend weight loss and multi-component behavioral lifestyle interventions for individuals with obesity. We also recommend checking a BMI at the time of the stroke and annually thereafter. For individuals with sleep apnea, we, we recommend positive airway pressure. 
And um, it is reasonable to evaluate for sleep apnea during a stroke workup, particularly in individuals who you think are at high risk for sleep apnea. So now we move to the section uh, by etiology. And um, the section is a little bit dense, um, but uh, I'll hope to, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. So we're gonna start with intracranial large artery atherosclerosis. So we know that individuals who have at least moderate stenosis of an intracranial artery, aspirin 325 is recommended. This was based on the WASED trial, which looked at warfarin versus aspirin and found aspirin to be superior to warfarin. Um, in individuals with severe stenosis, at least 70%, Addition of clopidogrel to aspirin for up to three months is reasonable. Now, this is um, not a based on randomized control trial data. It's looking at the medical management arm of Sampras, which was a trial of medical management versus stenting, and looking at the event rate in the Sampras trial when uh, medical management was clopidogrel plus aspirin, and comparing that event rate to the WASED trial, aspirin arm. So aspirin arm in the WASED trial versus aspirin plus clopidogrel in the Sampras trial, and they found lower event rates in the Sampras trial. So it's an indirect comparison, um, but based on that, it's reasonable to consider um, dual antiplatelets for three months in somebody with symptomatic severe stenosis. Now, if somebody has ipsilateral stenosis of at least 30%, the FAILS trial showed that addition of ticagrelor plus aspirin might be considered. And there have been numerous studies looking at celostazole plus aspirin <clears throat> um, or celostazole plus clopidogrel in patients with moderate to severe stenosis. And the data has been mixed. Um, so there's a TOS1, TOS2, catharsis, and CSPS trials. The CSPS trial showed a benefit of celostazole plus aspirin at, uh, for reduction of recurrent events. Catharsis just showed a benefit for reduction of vascular events and silent brain infarcts, and TOS1 and TOS2 did not show a benefit. So that's a 2B limited data recommendation. I'd also like to point out that um, those trials were done in a predominantly Asian population, so it may not be generalizable. And the last recommendation is in anyone with uh, moderate to severe intracranial athero, it, um, it's unknown whether to use clopidogrel, agronox, ticagrelor, or celostazole alone because those have not been studied. So bottom line, moderate to severe stenosis, aspirin 325. If it's severe um, symptomatic stenosis, reasonable, to add clopidogrel to aspirin for 90 days. And um, it's also reasonable to consider adding ticagrelor plus aspirin um, for up to 30 days, but that uh, data is not as convincing. The other thing to keep in mind is in the past, we often used to let the blood pressure ride a little bit higher in patients with symptomatic intracranial athero. However, post hoc analyses from WASID, Sampras, and the Chinese Intracranial Athero Registry showed that those who had a blood pressure of less than 140 actually had a lower risk of recurrent stroke than those with a higher blood pressure. So in anyone with moderate to severe intracranial athero, we recommend high intensity statin, antiplatelet, systolic blood pressure less than 140, and physical activity to reduce risk of recurrent stroke. With regards to angioplasty and stenting, there have been three studies that have looked at um, percutaneous transluminal angioplasty and stenting versus medical management in patients with symptomatic intracranial athero. And, the, um, uh, and there's harm to, for, in the stenting arm. So there are, there's a three harm recommendation for stenting in a symptomatic intracranial athero. Um, that's based on those three studies. And um, that's for, for symptomatic severe stenosis. Um, since 
the event rates in moderate stenosis are even lower. We extended that to a three harm recommendation for moderate stenosis, even though there has not been a trial for that. With regards to bypass, um, there have um, there are high rate high rates of stroke with bypass in patients um, who um, had bypass. Uh, for, for symptomatic uh, stenosis. So there's no benefit for uh, bypass either. So we've talked about intracranial athero. Now let's talk about extracranial large artery athero. So numerous studies have shown that uh, for symptomatic severe ICA stenosis, carotid endodorectomy is better than med medical management, provided the perioperative risk is less than 6%. This is uh, based on a Rothwell meta-analysis. Um, Dr. Rothwell did a meta-analysis which included NASET, ECST, and the VA trial. Um, the, in this meta-analysis, there was a 16% absolute benefit over five years for severe stenosis and a 5% benefit over five years for moderate stenosis. The periprocedural risk of 6% is based on those studies as well as CREST and um, statistical modeling. Now, um, anyone with symptomatic ICA stenosis should be on antiplatelet statin and have their blood pressure management. Now, the question of stenting versus CA is um, discussed in a couple of recommendations. So in those with who are at least 70 years old, it's reasonable to select CEA over stenting um, to reduce the risk, uh, the periprocedural stroke risk. Additionally, if you're going to do it within one week, it's reasonable to choose CEA over stenting because there's higher risk with stenting. Um, if revascularizing it with stenting or uh, uh, CEA, it's um, best to do it within two weeks of the index event. This is due, uh, a 2A recommendation with limited data. And if, if somebody has anatomic or medical conditions that increase the risk of surgery, it's reasonable to choose stenting over CEA. Um, and it's also um, reasonable to choose stenting over CEA in symptomatic patients who are at average or low risk of, com of complications. Um, the other uh, recommendation that's new is uh, there's a new procedure called transcarotid artery revascularization, revascularization or TCAR. We have limited data on this, and so we don't know if this is beneficial in carotid stenosis. And um, we do know in patients um, with recent TIA or stroke, bypass is not recommended in a, uh, uh, patients who have an occlusion. This is based on the cost trial. If, the, if a patient has symptomatic ICA stenosis of less than 50%, CEA or stenting is not recommended, and that's based on a, a Rothwell meta-analysis. We did have a separate section of vertebral athero. Um, in patients with vertebral artery stenosis, uh, there's no benefit for stenting. And aortic arch athero. So this has been a topic of conversation for many years. Unfortunately, the arch study did not answer the question of aspirin uh, of antiplatelet versus anticoagulation as it was underpowered. They had much fewer events in the study than they anticipated, likely due to um, intensive medical management. So at this time, in patients with aortic arch athero, we recommend uh, intensive lipid management, as well as antiplatelet therapy. For small vessel disease, there have been numerous studies looking at celostazole versus aspirin, um, actually two studies, CSBS and CSBS2. These, um, in CSBS2, uh, about two thirds of the patients had small vessel disease. They looked at celostazole versus aspirin. And although was, a celostal was associated with a lower, ischemic, a lower risk of ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, when you only look at ischemic stroke, there was a non-significant reduction. Therefore, um, at this time, uh, it's still uncertain whether to use celostazole for small vessel disease. 
For our atrial fibrillation, um, we have a class one recommendation to use anticoagulation um, for patients with atrial fibrillation, and that includes either warfarin or DOAC. Now we have another class one re uh, recommendation to use um, anyone who is non-valvular AFib to use a DOAC over warfarin, and that's based on the four randomized trials Aristotle rely engage AF to me 48 and um, rocket AF. Um, the other two recommendations are that you should treat paroxysmal and persistent AFib the same, and that you should treat a flutter the same as AFib. In addition, in patients who have uh, contraindications to long-term anticoagulation, you can consider a Watchman device. So it's a left atrial appendage uh, occlusion device. Um, it has been shown to have a non-significant increase in thrombotic risk, but a lower bleeding risk. So in somebody who can tolerate short duration of anticoagulation of 45 days, a Watchman device is reasonable. Now, the other thing is, um, when do you start anticoagulation after a stroke? This is a question that comes up pretty often. So let's say you have your stroke. If it's a TIA and the patient is found to be an AFib, it's fine to start anticoagulation immediately if there's no uh, evidence of stroke. Now, if it's a small stroke um, with low risk for hemorrhagic transformation, it's reasonable to start between days two and 14. And if it's a larger stroke or a high risk for hemorrhagic conversion, you're gonna wanna start anticoagulation after day 14 to reduce the risk of hemorrhagic transformation. For valvular heart disease, we divided it into three categories. So patients with valvular disease plus AFib, patients who have valvular disease who are in sinus, and patients who have valvular disease with endocarditis. So in patients with AFib, if you have um, valvular AFib, which is defined as moderate to severe mitral stenosis or mechanical valve, warfarin is recommended. Non-valvular AFib, we recommend a DOAC. If you're in sinus rhythm the, and you have non-rheumatic mitral valve disease, aortic valve disease, mitral valve or aortic valve prosthesis, you're gonna be on an antiplatelet. And if you have a mechanical mitral or aortic valve, we recommend warfarin. Now, I'll talk a little bit about this in the next slide, but generally, mitral valve has a higher um, goal, uh, INR of uh, 2.5 to 3.5, and aortic valve is two to three, unless you have a stroke, in which case it's reasonable to intensify the treatment goal to 2.5 to 3.5. In patients with infective endocarditis, the question is, are you gonna do surgery early or later? Now, if, there's a, if the patient has interest, uh, a risk for um, hemorrhage, has intracranial hemorrhage or a large stroke, the recommendation is to delay surgery. If they have a mobile vegetation or that's at least 10 millimeters, or they're having recurrent strokes despite antibiotics, early surgery is reasonable. So this um, algorithm goes back to what I was talking about, the, the INR goal. So by prosthetic valve, you're gonna do antiplatelet, mechanical valve, if it's a mitral valve, you're gonna do an INR goal of 2.5 to 3.5. If they had a stroke, you're gonna add aspirin to that. And for a mechanical aortic valve, if they have a stroke while they have their valve and they're on anticoagulation, it's reasonable to either intensify the INR goal to 2.5 to 3.5 or add a baby aspirin. And there have been studies that show that dibigatran should not be used in the setting of a mechanical valve. For cardiomyopathy, a, key, a few key recommendations um, and also intracardiac thrombus. So LV or left atrial uh, thrombus, you're gonna anticoagulate. If there's an LVAD, then the recommendation is warfarin plus aspirin. LV non-compaction, warfarin, and others, it's gonna be based on the individual condition. Now, 
PFO is a relatively controversial topic. There have been numerous different um, guidelines with respect to PFO, but I'm going to kind of give you our recommendations in a nutshell. So first you have to look at the age of the patient. So in individuals who are 18 to 60, that's the age range in which these studies were done, and they have a non-lacunar stroke and a PFO, you're gonna look for other causes. If you don't find any other causes, then it's possible that it's a paradoxical embolism. Now the, two, the things you should think about are, is it a high-risk PFO or a low-risk PFO? High-risk would be someone with either an atrial septal aneurysm or a large right to left shunt. And this has been defined differently, but in different studies, but one um, example of a definition is at least 20 micro bubbles. So high risk PFO, um, PFO, uh, PFO closure is reasonable. It's a 2A recommendation. If it's a low risk PFO, then the benefit of closure is not well established. And then you want to look at other things um, to, to help make your decision. One really useful tool is the ROPE score, which is the risk of paradoxical embolism score that tells you the likelihood that the PFO is related to the stroke. The next slide is on dissection. Now there is a separate um, scientific statement on dissection, but we have a short section here. Um, so the main points are antithrombotic therapy for at least three months. And the CADIS trial looked at antiplatelet versus anticoagulation and uh, basically showed no difference in the primary endpoint at one year. So it is reasonable to use either aspirin or warfarin to prevent recurrent stroke or TIA. Now in patients who are having recurrent strokes despite maximal medical management, it, or if they develop a pseudoaneurysm, it is reasonable to consider endovascular therapy, but that's a 2B recommendation. Um, we have a new section on embolic stroke of undetermined source. This has been a topic of active research. Now, just remember the definition of ESIS is a cryptogenic stroke that looks embolic. Um, and uh, so in patients with ESIS, uh, uh, treatment with DOAX is not recommended, and that's based on the Navigate ESIS and Respect ESIS trials. In addition, uh, treatment with Ticagrelor is not recommended, and that's based on a post hoc analysis of patients with ESIS who were enrolled in the Socrates trial. This is the last uh, section, um, and it's the systems of care section. So we divided it into health systems based interventions. So uh, interventions that are changing the way you deliver care in the health system versus uh, behavior change interventions where you're expecting the uh, patient to change their behavior. And there have been numerous studies um, with really mixed results, but a few things um, uh, are being recommended. One is that it's important for hospitals and outpatient clinics to uh, look at quality and improvement programs to look at um, nationally accepted evidence-based guidelines for secondary stroke prevention. The second, which is based on some randomized controlled trials, is to use a multidisciplinary team. And what we mean by a multidisciplinary team, that can include advanced practice providers, nurses, and pharmacists to control vascular risk factors. And on the left, you can see a few of the studies that, that utilize multidisciplinary teams. The third is to use uh, decision support tools. So the fastest trial looked at an electronic decision support tool for managing um, uh, uh, secondary stroke prevention. There are numerous trials that are currently underway um, looking at strategies to optimize secondary stroke prevention. It's an area of active research. And then the second section is on behavioral, oh, sorry, I skipped a slide. So, uh, so behavior change interventions. So these are interventions where you're trying to help the patient change their behavior, whether it's regards, with regards to diet, lifestyle, medication adherence. Um, and so in order to do a behavior change intervention, it's really important to use a, a model of behavior change uh, the social sciences have very robust models of behavior change. 
So our first recommendation is um, to, to target um, stroke literacy, lifestyle factors, and medication adherence for cardiovascular events. The second is that we don't know the optimal tools, but motivational interviewing has been shown to be um, uh, useful uh, in the MISS trial, as well as um, a text messaging uh, trial of SMS for stroke showed that text messaging was helpful for medication adherence. Um, a meta-analysis of lifestyle interventions have shown that you have larger effects if you combine a kind of counseling lifestyle intervention with an actual exercise uh, based group exercise based intervention. In addition, several small cardiac rehab trials have shown evidence of improvement in cardiovascular risk factors, but not secondary stroke. And the one clear thing that we know is that it's not, not enough to just give someone a pamphlet or a handout um, in order to change their behavior. You really need more robust behavioral intervention. And finally, we have a section on health equity. Um, there have been numerous uh, trials, secondary stroke prevention trials, trying to reduce disparities in stroke. They've all had uh, mixed results, um, but there are a few key take home points. One is that it's critical to address social determinants of health. The second is that it's, it's helpful, as mentioned earlier, to monitor evidence-based performance measures. The third, and this is based on an AHA uh, scientific statement, is to use the AHRQ precautions toolkit for health literacy to ensure that your um, materials are uh, appro appropriate um, for individuals with limited English proficiency. And finally, in patients who are from vulnerable groups, um, the, uh, uh, the, the best model for reducing um, risk factors for stroke remains unknown. And um, I included a few of these key knowledge gaps here. So I'm just gonna give you our top 10 take home messages. I know that was really a lot of information. I tried to give you the, the, key, um, the key messages, but let's just summarize real quick. So one, your strategy for secondary stroke uh, prevention depends on the etiology of the stroke. The second is you need to manage vascular risk factors. Those include hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, diet, and physical activity. And that segues into number three, that it's really critical to address lifestyle and that you can't change someone's behavior with just a handout. You need to refer them to a more robust program that includes either motivational interviewing or some kind of group support or self-management support. Antithrombotics are recommended in most patients. The only time you're gonna use dual antiplatelets is for short-term use in either um, patients with small stroke or high-risk TIA for the first uh, three months or in patients with symptomatic intracranial athero for three months. In atrial fibrillation, um, anticoagulation is recommended. Um, in most cases, you're gonna, we're gonna recommend a DOAC over a warfarin. And if somebody has embolic stroke of undetermined uh, uh, source, it's, um, we recommend looking for uh, occult AFib with long-term rhythm monitoring. For severe extra uh, extracranial stenosis, we recommend um, either CEA or stenting, depending on patient circumstances. And severe intracranial stenosis, don't stent as first line, use aggressive medical management, which includes um, antithrombotic, statin therapy, blood pressure control, and diet and physical activity. For PFOs, in certain circumstances, it's reasonable to close the PFO, particularly in those under 60 with a high-risk PFO. And finally, ESA should not be treated empirically with anticoagulants or ticagrelor, and there are uh, ongoing studies to determine the optimal management of ESAs. Um, and so that leaves us some time for Q&A. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Thank you. Um, anybody have any questions? I do see one, but feel free to type them into the chat box. And um, Dr. Tofigi will, Tofigi, sorry, will answer those. And, um, or you can star six to unmute yourself. 
So the first question is, can you further discuss aspects that influence which patient should have a TTE or a TEE to determine stroke etiology? The 2019 AHA AIS guidelines state the benefit of routine use of a echocardiogram is uncertain. For example, should lacunar strokes have cardiac structures imaged if the patient has known vascular risk factors? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so if we go back to the diagnostic slide, one sec. Um, so it's a 2B recommendation to look for cardiac sources of embolism with TTE or TEE. Um, and so I think, you know, you're going to find different practices based on the institution where you work. We, um, we don't have um, great evidence, but just because something hasn't been tried, um, you know, there hasn't been a randomized control trial doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. Um, and so in this case, you're going to find different practices at different institutions. Okay, thank you. Um, any additional questions? You can either star six to unmute yourself, type them in, or you can unmute yourself at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so I'm not seeing any additional questions. So um, I just want to thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Um, thank you, everybody who joined us. And we will be sending out a link to the presentation um, within the next week or so, so that you'll have that available. And if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out anytime. And I just want to point you to the guidelines on the go. That's an excellent resource. Looks like we do have one more question here. Is there a reason that the new nursing guidelines did not use the same evidence-based criteria? Um, I cannot speak to that. Um, so the, the, do you mean the, the level of ed evidence and the strength of the recommendations? Yes, she says. Okay. Um, so, the, I'm not sure, the, um, the AHA um, has pretty strict rules um, about the, the using the level of ed evidence and strength of the recommendations. So I would, uh, I don't know enough about the new nursing guidelines to, to comment on that. I'm not sure if someone else um, can comment on that. Uh, I can look into it. Oh, she said, thank you. And I can look into it, Donna, for you and um, see if I can find any information and get back to you. Any additional questions? Okay, again, thank you so much for joining the presentation. It's an excellent presentation and we really appreciate your time and expertise. So- Thank you um, so much for having me. Yep, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye.